Welcome to section two of the week's three and four lecture series. Here is our summary slide with an overview of the most important questions that you'll need to be able to answer by the end of this lecture. According to paleontologist Niles Eldridge, Darwin didn't know anything about why organisms resemble their parents or the basis of heritable variations. Instead, he hypothesized that tiny particles called gemmules that accumulated in sex organs transferred a blend of mating pairs' genes to their offspring. This idea was part of a larger, inaccurate theory of blending inheritance. Without knowledge of genes or how they operated, the best guess that biologists of the 19th century could come up with was that the traits of parents mixed evenly in offspring. However, it is easy to spot the logical error here. If all children were an average of the characteristics of their parents, variation would be lost over time in populations, meaning that natural selection couldn't influence organisms. To understand this a bit better, let's think about a common dog breed, the Labrador Retriever. If blending inheritance accurately represented the actions of genes, we would expect a cross between a yellow lab and a chocolate lab to result in a litter of entirely golden brown puppies. Instead, there are three distinct colors of Labradors, chocolate, golden, and black. This variation would have been erased long ago under conditions of blending inheritance. Interestingly, Darwin and his contemporaries were aware of the flaws in this theory. They observed that we're not a simple copy of our parents, nor are we a midpoint between the two. Traits can be masked. Genetic diseases can crop up. All of these points were discovered and observed long before humans knew anything about DNA. You might not know the face of Gregor Mendel, but perhaps you remember Dwight Schrute III, a salesman and beet farmer from the TV series, The Office. To some, Dwight is the celebrity twin of Austrian monk Gregor Mendel, and to evolutionary biology nerds, it's the other way around. Gregor Mendel is the man who succeeded in figuring out the real mechanism of inheritance. During the late 1850s and early 1860s, he bred pea plants and discovered that the passing down of traits such as flower color and seed texture followed noticeable patterns. When plants with particular traits were bred with each other, the hybrid offspring didn't have blended or intermediate traits. Rather, offspring plants had either traits of one or the other of the two parents' plants. The results of tens of thousands of plant breeding experiments helped Mendel pave the way for an understanding of units of inheritance, also known as genes. Let's go over some of the key points about Mendel that you will need to know for the quiz. Mendel was an Augustinian monk with a fondness for peas. He grew 28,000 plants and was able to identify specific traits that patterned breeding in these peas. He inferred that a discrete physical unit was responsible for each of these characteristics, passed from parents to offspring. Mendel is credited with producing three important insights upon which the field of genetics was built. The first of the three conclusions from his many experiments is called the law of segregation. Each inherited trait is defined by a gene pair. Parental genes are randomly separated to sex cells so that sex cells contain only one gene of the pair. Offspring therefore inherit one genetic allele from each parent when sex cells unite in fertilization. Each parent gives one random allele to the offspring. Alleles make up the genotype or the genetic instructions that produce phenotypes or the physical makeup of the organism.
Mendel's second important conclusion was the idea that some genes are dominant and others are recessive. Dominant traits mask recessive ones. They are not necessarily more abundant, they are more powerful when it comes to determining an organism's phenotype or aspects of the physical body. You are probably familiar with these ideas. To illustrate how dominant and recessive traits work, here is a diagram of a plant breeding experiment in which we can see that purple flowers are a dominant trait and white flowers are the results of a recessive trait. When crossed, these parent plants will produce entirely purple offspring. You may have created Punnett squares or breeding diagrams in a high school science class. Later in this lecture, we will create a Punnett square of our own, which will help you to clarify the P drawing I've given you here. Mendel believed that genes for different traits were sorted separately from one another and not dependent on each other. What does this mean? Let's say we have peas that produce seeds which are either smooth or wrinkled and either yellow or green in color. In this slide, we have what is called a dye hybrid cross. It is a chart which shows all possible offspring if two parents who are heterozygotes or whose genotypes contain both dominant and recessive alleles for particular traits are crossbred. We will talk more about heterozygotes and genotypes in a moment, so don't worry if these terms are unfamiliar. Essentially, what we see is that the color and texture traits are inherited separately from one another such that wrinkly yellow seeds and smooth yellow seeds are both possible. In other words, texture and color are coded for in separate genes, and each parent contributes one allele for each trait. In truth, it gets quite a bit more complicated than this, and many genes are in fact influenced by and dependent upon each other. Such genes are called linked. We will talk about those later in the lecture. Mendel laid an incredibly important foundation for the field of genetics. However, it's important to note that he was incredibly lucky in stumbling upon traits that could be understood in terms of simple inheritance, whereby one gene controlled one trait, for example, color, in pea flowers. In reality, traits like the ones Mendel studied are rare. There are many other types of traits out there, including all of those traits described in this slide, which Mendel did not know about and could not have captured in his simple plant experiments. Mendelian inheritance is the most simple and straightforward form of inheritance, or the transmission of genetic information from one generation to the next. In Mendelian inheritance, which as I mentioned previously, only applies to some traits, each gene has two subunits called alleles. Each allele is either dominant or recessive. Pairs of alleles are called the genotype. The physical appearance they result in is called the phenotype. Here are some examples of Mendelian traits, or traits that are controlled by only one gene. Can you guess what each of these images refers to? Let's start with the upper right. We have two parents with their young child who unfortunately has Tay-Sachs disease. You'll be reading about Tay-Sachs for the readings for weeks three and four. Tay-Sachs disease is typically found in people with certain ancestry, such as Eastern European Jews. It is a recessive trait and it is caused by the buildup of a fatty substance in the brain that destroys nerve cells. Recent research indicates that people with Irish ancestry, like those shown above, are also more likely to be carriers of Tay-Sachs. We will talk about what a carrier is momentarily. Directly below this image is a magazine cover advertising a story about Angelina Jolie's double mastectomy. Why did she have a double mastectomy without ever having breast cancer? Jolie, like the Medina family described in the Wandering Cancer Gene reading, for weeks three and four, has the BRCA1 gene, or a mutated version of the BRCA gene. We all have the BRCA gene, but some people inherit a variety that is mutated and has been linked to multiple forms of cancer. 
It's estimated that 55 to 65 percent of women with the BRCA1 mutation will develop breast cancer before age 70. The mutated variants of the BRCA gene, BRCA1 and 2, are dominant meaning that the child of someone with a mutated BRCA gene has a 50% chance of inheriting, inheriting that mutated gene. Lastly, we have an image of a Maasai cattle herder in East Africa enjoying a fresh cup of cow's milk. The gene for lactase persistence is actually dominant, even though many people all over the world do not have this gene and therefore can't digest the milk sugar lactose. Mendelian diseases like Tay-Sachs have enabled modern geneticists to understand the perils and dangers of inheritance. Individuals can have no symptoms of a disease and be perfectly healthy, but still be carriers. What does this mean? It means that they are heterozygotes. A heterozygote is a genotype in which someone has both a dominant and recessive allele. If a disease is caused by a recessive trait, such as Tay-Sachs, a carrier has one harmful, harmful recessive allele that is masked by a dominant allele, which produces a healthy individual who may or may not be aware that they can transmit a deadly disease to their children if they have children with another carrier. Let's take a look at potential outcomes of two carriers of Tay-Sachs deciding to have children together. This diagram shows two generations with dominant alleles in blue-purple and recessive ones in orange. We can see that we have two heterozygotes, the parents, in generation one. When we cross two heterozygotes, we end up with three probable offspring types, with one being more likely than the other two. The likelihood that this couple will have an unaffected or homozygous dominant child is 25%. The likelihood that they will have a child with Tay-Sachs or homozygous recessive genotype is also 25%. The likelihood that they will have children who are carriers or heterozygotes is 50%. If these probabilities aren't yet making sense to you, in just a few slides, we will do a breeding experiment like this one, and you will use something called a Punnett square to get at these probabilities. What are some traits that don't follow Mendel's rules? As it turns out, Mendelian traits are rather rare. Polygenic traits are traits controlled by multiple genes. These include eye color, height, and skin color. Pleiotropic traits are the result of one gene controlling many traits. One common example of pleiotropy is the gene for tyrosine synthesis. Tyrosine is an amino acid, or an essential building block of the human body. It has many roles, described here in the slide, which include the production of melanin, or skin pigment, and therefore the production of tyrosine controls a variety of different traits in the body. Here's an at-home genetic experiment that I would like for you to try. The three traits described above are believed to be Mendelian. In other words, they are controlled by just one gene, which has dominant and recessive variants. According to Stanford Health, advanced sleep phase syndrome is a disorder in which the timing of sleep and the peak period of alertness are advanced several hours relative to the average person's sleep and wake cycle. People with advanced sleep phase syndrome generally have difficulty staying awake unless they go to bed very early. A Chu syndrome refers to the trait of feeling the need to sneeze when you look toward the sun. Some folks immediately sneeze or have a strong urge to do so as they turn their head toward bright sunlight. Lastly, there are two types of earwax, wet or dry. You inherit a particular type of earwax from your parents. Let's start by writing out your phenotype. Recreate the table above in your notes. Your phenotype is the actual name of the trait. For example, I am a sun sneezer, meaning I have a Chu syndrome, meaning that in the phenotype column within the Chu syndrome row, I would write sneezes in the sun. 
you might want to hit pause for a moment to set up and fill out your table. Next, we'll write out our genotypes. This can be tricky because we will need to do some guesswork if we have the dominant trait. While our phenotype is visible, our genotype is invisible unless we have the recessive trait. If you have wet earwax, for example, you have two possible genotypes, capital W, lowercase w, or capital W, capital W. Because we don't have time to analyze your DNA, you are simply going to pick heterozygous or homozygous dominant if you have one of the dominant traits. For the next step, I'd like you to use your own data from the previous slide and find someone else in your household or call them on the phone in order to figure out their phenotype and genotypes. After you have this information, you are going to cross your genes with theirs by putting your genotype across the top and theirs going down the side. Bring one allele from each parent together in each box. Then see if you can figure out your probabilities for each of the offspring phenotypes that result from this fake breeding. This exercise concludes part two of the lectures for weeks three and four.